Uh, my name is Sanjay Agrawal and I'm a respiratory consultant in Leicester and also the National Specialty Advisor for Tobacco Addiction through NHS England. Now this webinar um, has been, uh, is hosted by Action on Smoking um, on Health and will focus on the importance of building effective partnerships between the NHS and local authority services to support comprehensive implementation of the NHS long-term tobacco treatment dependence pathway. This is part of a series of ASH webinars um, focusing on, on different aspects of the long-term plan. So far, we've had webinars on pregnancy and mental health, and you can see those uh, on the YouTube channel for ASH. And we've got future webinars that are planned that will cover topics such as pharmacotherapy and smoke-free mental health settings, as well as the metrics that are being collected to support this programme. Now, the NHS long-term plan includes a commitment to provide NHS stop smoking services to all hospital inpatients, to pregnant women and those in mental health inpatient settings. These new NHS tobacco dependence treatment services will be additional, and that's the key thing, and complementary to the services already being provided by local authorities. They are not in any way to replace them. They are as well as um, the local authority services. But if we're to maximise the, um, the benefits of the long-term plan, it's clear that the NHS and local authority services will need to work much closer together, which is really welcome to ensure patients are supported to quit during their interaction with the health service, but also that they go back into the community and that quit journey continues. The integration of, um, sorry, the introduction of integrated care systems or ICSs will help facilitate this joined up approach. Uh, but we don't want to wait until ICSs are finalized because they're still uh, forming in many areas, uh, but we should be taking steps to build these partnerships right now. And I know that is happening across the country. We are delighted to have over 300 people from across the country registered to the event today. So thank you for registering and I hope you enjoy this webinar. So can I have the next slide, please? So uh, there's a bit of housekeeping. Um, firstly, that this meeting is being recorded so that other people can view it or you can view it again at a later date and the slides will be shared with all attendees after the event and uploaded onto the ASH website. Um, the second thing is, is to the panellists and attendees, if you could keep yourselves muted and turn videos off unless you are presenting. ASH staff will mute anyone who is unmuted um, and uh, not presenting. The meeting will include time for questions, so please add any questions, comments or discussion points to the meeting chat. They're going to be really important and will help us at the end. Um, we'll try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, if you do have any other issues, then please post them in the meeting chat or email um, admin at smokefreeaction.org.uk. So can I have the next slide, please? Today's event is an opportunity to hear from areas which are developing a collaborative approach to designing, commissioning and delivering stop smoking support. The case studies will be followed by a Q&A session with all of the presenters chaired by Hazel Cheeseman, Deputy Chief Executive of ASH. I'll, be on, I'll also be on the panel to answer any questions about the long-term plan rollout. The Q&A will also be joined by Joanna Feeney from the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities and is the regional lead for the North East and Yorkshire. So I'm going to try and keep the speakers to time and we're going to start off with and I'm going to hand over to our first speaker who is Heidi Croucher, Dorset ICS tobacco, uh, Treating Tobacco Dependency Programme Manager. So um, over to you Heidi and thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Can you all hear me? We can, Heidi. Brilliant. OK, so yeah, let's move on to the um, first slide. So I'm going to talk to you today about the Dorset Care Programme and how collaboration has been developed and, and what the history is there in Dorset. So I'm going back a little bit. So 2015, um, 
Local Authority Public Health Dorset funded our smoke free pregnancy pathway. It was a four year pilot using the Baker Clear model. Then came um, a couple of years later, smoke free hospital sites. Our mental health and community hospitals in Dorset took real leadership in that with um, the pharmacotherapy offer and e cigarette offer within half an hour of admission. And lots of learns have um, come out of that. Then um, a year later, so 2018, I was approached by Public Health Dorset and asked if I would um, program manage the smoke free pregnancy pathway across the region. So up until then, I was a smoking and pregnancy midwife at one trust and then uh, went on secondment to local authority to help support the other trusts within Dorset. In 2019, as soon as the long term plan came out, Public Health Dorset set up our treating tobacco dependency steering group um, with really good, well representation uh, from across the ICS, really from the very start. So back in 2019 and that representation looked like um, directors of nursing or their deputy dons from each of the trusts. We had respiratory consultant. We had the smoking and pregnancy program manager, which was me at that time. The mental health smoke free program manager we had representation from general practice the community stop smoking services and also the local pharmacy committee um, and it was that steering group that really got things moving in dorset and to be able to talk to you about where we're at now with cares and then earlier this year um, the secondment that i had with public health dorset changed slightly in that I was also now um, overseeing the acute and mental health pathways as well as the maternity pathway and that's a comment became full time so that I could do that. And all this has um, meant that we can really push forward with CARED and um, just to say that CARED is our Dorset treating tobacco dependency program based on the Ottawa Cure and SLAM model. Next slide, thank you. So how collaboration has been maintained, and this has been absolutely paramount. We have, the, it has taken ownership by the whole ICS, a real whole system approach. The CARED um, SRO is head of public health. Each trust has gone on to develop its own um, sub-treatment tobacco dependency working group, which includes maternity and mental health. All those subgroups feed into the main working group across the ICS. So the CARED program manager, which is me, I, I've got a clinical background. I am a midwife. I'm still employed by the NHS Trust and I'm seconded out to local authority to program manage CARED. Um, and I think that's been so important with the rollout and where we are now because I get how the hospital systems work. I understand the senior management team structures. I appreciate how busy they are and I think um, this part of it actually has been really quite helpful in terms of rollout. The um, very brief advice training that's happened to frontline staff as we've rolled out on each ward um, has been co-delivered. We've, we've used a national trainer. I've been there as well to do the training alongside the national trainer and also the Community Stop Smoking Services have been part of that training team. So a real team approach. And when each ward within the hospitals have gone live with CARED, um, I've been there the day it's gone live to help give extra support guidance to the staff with the new electronic system that they're using, um, just to be there to answer any questions, contact IT if we've got problems, and that's proven to be really helpful also. So what is CARED? I keep talking about it. So this is the pathway um, that's happening within the hospitals by the admitting teams. We don't yet have our treating tobacco dependency team, although the closing date is today for the band three and band six jobs. So CARED, it's to offer carbon monoxide screening to all patients on admission before we then ask the smoking status, advise on the risks if they are a smoker and offer within two hours pharmacotherapy. The referral happens on admission to the community stop smoking services. Um, so they can continue that pathway and the medication on discharge. Evaluate how well we're doing, what the data looks like, where we can improve, and we are continually seeking to improve how we're, um, how we're doing with CARED. And then the final bit is to dispense that two-week supply of medication on discharge. Next slide, thank you. 
So the local authority and the NHS collaboration has been central here uh, with the rollout of CARED. So the CO equipment and the consumables for the admissions was originally procured by local authority and then the ongoing costs have been picked up by each trust. Just to say that we did exclude mental health um, inpatients on admission for the CO testing because it's just not appropriate. To do the Ask Advise Act assessment electronically, all the IT software developments have happened um, within the trust, procured by the trusts. Most trusts have built them in-house, one trust went out and procured to an external provider, but the trust picks up this cost. In terms of the referral, so the smoke stop service, um, the community smoke stop services helped with the training. Um, with each um, frontline staff as their ward went live and they covered the referral side of it. So how to refer on to community state small community stop smoking services as part of that admission ready for when the patient is discharged. Public Health Dorset are currently building our dashboard data set. It's, it's quite big. We've got all our, all our KPIs that we're working to um, and then each trust will feed into that data set. Uh, once it goes live, which hopefully will be in the next few weeks. And then in terms of the medication, so the two week um, supply on discharge has been picked up by the trust and then the out of hospital supply that will continue in the community is currently being funded by local authority. So real team working to make care happen and, and allow the patient to be the absolute centre here. Enablers, barriers and outcomes. So um, due to time, I haven't actually got long to go into too much of our data, but what I did want to say was in terms of the referral part of this pathway, that's the bit that we're not actually doing very well. So um, we've screened nearly 4000 patients now since we've gone live over the last few months with CARED. And um, in terms of CO monitoring, around half of the patients, so 50% of, of all those patients have undertaken the CO test. Those that haven't were because they weren't clinically well enough. Um, around half of the patients that were smokers have accepted the medication. The bit that isn't working is that referral process um, and around 10% of the patients who are coming in who do smoke are being referred through and it's even less within our um, mental health inpatients. So Public Health Dorset want to capture some staff insights, they want to do a piece of work, some sort of behavioural diagnostic um, study identifying what are the key barriers that the hospital staff face and why those referrals aren't happening so that we can put measures in place to improve that. And certainly um, the next point, some of the early staff feedback that we have had, um, which is on the next bullet point, is that the staff are finding that they just don't have capacity and um, it, as much as they've got good intentions, a time barrier is getting in the way. And Wait, what they've asked for what is what to have to an early Sorry, I've got an echo now, Sanjay, I think what they what the staff are asking for is to have a direct link within the software so that the automatic referral takes place as part of the admission and they don't have to go into a different platform to do that. Thank you. Next slide. And finally, really about and I've called it passing the baton. Um, the mental health pathway is slightly different in that the new tobacco dependency team will continue the care of these patients on discharge. So we're not going to hand these patients over to community stop smoking services. And finally, in preparation for the pharmacy enhanced service, uh, a fair few meetings have already taken place now across the ICS in Dorset around how actually are we going to join up all the dots? How is this referral from secondary care going to happen? What platform are we going to use farm outcomes? Is it going to happen through DMS? Um, and it's great that actually these early conversations already start and happening between um, everybody that it needs to happen within. And that's it. Thank you very much. And I think I just about nailed it within time. Yeah. Sanjay, you've muted yourself. Thank you. So, so Heidi, thank you. That was really useful, really helpful, great insights. 
Um, I thought the bits for me that were particularly interesting that you said was the stuff about your secondment from the NHS into the local authority to lead the service. And, and we've done it also the other way. And I know lots of systems do it the other way too. Uh, and knowing the NHS is really important in terms of joining all the dots. Um, but actually the referral rate without the tobacco dependency advisors in, you know, that uh, have not yet been hired, um, the referral rates are still um, uh, uh, probably where they were to begin with. And I think that shows the importance of hopefully getting those tobacco dependency advisors in place. So that was a really helpful uh, overview. Thanks very much, Heidi. Now I'm going to move on now and we uh, I'm really pleased to welcome our next two speakers who are uh, Gemma King, the programme lead at Gateshead Council and Joanna, uh, Joanne Coleman, quality improvement lead nurse at Gateshead um, NHS Foundation Trust. So over to you and thank you. Hi, yeah, so um, so I'm Gemma, just in case you get mixed up between us. Um, so yeah, so our, um, we're going to talk through our journey implementing the Stop Smoking service within um, our Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead. Um, next slide, please. So it, it kind of all started with a chat over a coffee, really, and we, we got together as a local authority and a trust and kind of thought about what our vision was. And um, it turned out that really quickly that we had the same vision. Um, we just wanted to help the population of Gateshead to become smoke free. We thought about what our vision might look like in like the shorter term, six months a year, and then the longer term, so over five years and how we might go about achieving it. And we thought, well, what can we do quite quickly? What can we do now with the resources we had? And we thought, well, we can deliver training to staff. And as a local authority, we invested in the trust um, common oxide monitors so that there was at least one or two common oxide monitors um, in every ward of the hospital. Um, and that meant that common monoxide readings could be done alongside other checks such as blood pressure, initially in, in um, pre-assessment and maternity. And then once that was working really well, we expanded into um, our cardiac, cancer and um, respiratory wards. Um, and meanwhile, we were selling our vision to everyone that would listen in the hospital. So we would say, could you imagine how many bed days we would save if we could get our patients to stop smoking? How many less readmissions there would be? How many babies' lives we would save if we could get parents to stop smoking? Next slide, please. So then we came up with a plan. So we've kind of put this down as a bit of a SWOT analysis so that you could better understand our thought process. But we knew our main strength was 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 our, us, our, the team that we had. So um, we had um, support at a, a clinical level um, with Dr. Ruth Sharrock, who is um, a respiratory consultant within the QE hospital, but she's also the tobacco control lead for the ICS. So who better to fly the flag for the work that we were doing? And to be honest, Ruth was pinnacle for a lot of the work that we've managed to achieve and um, without her it would just wouldn't have been possible. We had um, myself and my colleague Paul Gray um, who are programme leads within um, the local authority and um, provide expertise in stop smoking and tobacco control and then we also had Joe who was an expert in quality improvement and change management. We also had our public health consultant take um, a paper to the trust board, which achieved us sort of a buy-in at a, a board level. And that really helped us. It meant that Joe became involved in the programme from a quality improvement point of view. And it meant that any changes that we were trying to make could be implemented sort of trust-wide. That was great. We're also very lucky um, in Gateshead that we have the support of Fresh, um, the Regional Tobacco Control um, Office, and also we have a brilliant alliance, which is um, chaired by um, one of our councillors who was very passionate about the smoke free agenda. And we have a wide range of partners that we could rely on when we needed to. We were also very aware um, of our weaknesses. So we knew there was organisational boundaries we would have to push and bureaucratic systems to navigate and financial constraints, of course. Um, but we went with our opportunities. We knew we were motivated. We had the experience and the knowledge and the skill set. Anything we didn't know, we quickly learned. We learned that we had to know how to write a business case if we wanted anything done um, within the trust. And we were always aware of threats. So people who were bureaucratic, who didn't like change and didn't want us to succeed. But ultimately, we think that what we've achieved what we have because we found the right person to do the job um, at the time. Next slide, please. And I'm going to pass over to Joe. Hi everyone, so my name is Joanne Coleman and I'm a quality improvement lead at the QE hospital, but prior to that I've been a vascular nurse specialist 
and a matron. So stop smoking was really high on my agenda. So obviously, because I'm in quality improvement, I've got a little bit of a driver diagram here. So one of the things that I tried to create was to build up that appetite within the organisation. So made sure that people thought about the safety and continuous improvement side of things, making sure that we brought the experience of the people who um, are working at the front line, but also from the families and patients who were there. So they had quite a bit of input in how we would get the services to work. We also began to make sure that we captured all of this. So I'm um, all about quality data and making sure that we can demonstrate the wins that we, we could create, especially those quick wins that we could create as well around the, the carbon monoxide monitoring, the train and, and um, making sure that we had NRT available. Next slide, please. But this was very much a team approach. So one of the things that we were able to do was um, actually say, what can we do together and how can we pull that together as part of the Smoking Alliance? So when some funding becomes available, Gemma and I are all over it. How can we use that funding? What can we do? So one of the things that we've been able to do this year is with some funding that was available through the local authority and the CCG was create three band three stop smoking advisors. We had high hopes with the funding that we we're going to get from the ICS, but I'm going to be honest, it wasn't as much as we thought we were going to get. I had this whole Ottawa model in me, in me sort of mind of how we were going to run that out. So we're just having to do what we can do with the money that we've got and be creative. So Gemma's right, business cases are our way forward and we will literally go to any department that we can to try and pull some funding to try and pull things together. So our plan for the future is that we'll have a stop smoking service within the trust. We've got a hub set up, the um, QE facilities have given us some space to be able to have a hub at the centre of the hospital. We've been able to recruit, we're three band threes and we're about to uh, recruit another band three within maternity. We're also going to recruit two band six nurse specialists or specialist workers. And we've also been able to work with maternity to say, actually, what can we do together? And they've got a public health midwife who's amazing and she's coming into our team. And then I've managed to get Gemma sorted with an honorary contract so she can come and help deliver the train and support the service. So it's very much about that team approach and how we can navigate through whatever we need to navigate to get things done. Next slide, please. And we have had some really good achievements. So one of the first things we were able to do because we had the buy in from our public health um, team at the at the local authority and within the trust, we were able to get our NHS smoke free pledge and that we were one of the first trusts in our area to be able to do that. We've got a no smoking site and again, that's working with the um, local authority. We've got a path that runs through the centre of our hospital called the Black Path. And it was myth and legend that this was um, a right of way and therefore staff could go and smoke there. However, we discovered after working with the local authority, that's not true. And so we managed to be able to get that sorted out. We've got digital systems in place so that we can record the status of patients. We've got text messaging service on discharge, which was shortlisted for a health service journal award. We've got NRT available 24 seven. We've got PGDs for staff. So they're able to supply that NRT, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a physio or whether you're a pharmacist. I'll hand over to Gemma. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned that we did some training with staff and that meant that the staff in the hospital were confident to initiate quit attempts with patients. And then on discharge, those patients were passed into our community stop smoking um, support. But Engage said we don't have a specialist stop smoking service. So to in we rely on GP practices and pharmacies to deliver that for us. So to integrate those was was uh, more difficult. But what we did um, manage to achieve was we um, commissioned the the QE outpatient pharmacy, which is separate to the hospital, but based within the, the, the trust site. Um, and again, that was a very difficult task that was pushed back at board level. But again, with the help of Joe, we navigated that and did manage to succeed with that. And it means that that pharmacy takes on the majority of the patients and continues their support um, to the end of their quit attempt. Again, common oxide monitors I mentioned, and more recently we've had to do some training around the safety of carbon monoxide monitoring post COVID and because a lot of the staff were more reluctant to complete those checks. But with those monitors, it means we can target the support where it's needed. 
And finally, we are also aware that we do have a lot of staff that smoke. So we've enlisted the help of our occupational health within the hospital. We have around 320 members of staff at last count that smoke. Um, and we know that helping our own staff to stop is equally as important as working with our, uh, with our um, patients. Um, and that's it. Um, so we'll happy to answer questions um, later on. Brilliant. Thank you both. That was really, uh, really interesting. Just again, some of the things I took um, from your presentation there um, was, um, well, firstly, I like a really, I like a nice driver diagram. And maybe we should do a quality improvement uh, webinar. Um, I've not talked to you about that yet, Hazel, but I like the idea of that. Um, but also the the discharge. Um, so one of the things you said was that um, every that your area doesn't necessarily have a local stop smoking service. So you 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 or at least the GPs and the pharmacists have been doing that that part of the pathway when a patient is discharged from hospital. And that's what we're seeing all over the country, that um, each hospital will have different services or different types of services that they can refer into when the patient is discharged from the hospital. And, and there are lots of different solutions that people can um, utilise, whether it's pharmacies or other things. And maybe we can bring that up in the chat at the end. But anyway, I wanted to go on now to our, our next speaker, who is Charlotte Jacks, who is the Partnership Commissioning Manager at Wakefield Council. Oh, no, it's not. Um, sorry, sorry. That's all right. It. It's not. It's, it's Helena Postnet, Specialist Registrar in Public Health, Devon County Council, and Jane Bullard, Health and Equalities Project Manager um, in Devon. I think I'm going to get the sack for um, any future Last chairs. time I checked, I was Helena, but that's all right. Thanks very much. Great, right, well, welcome. Um, um, thank you very much. Yes, so um, I'm Helena Posnett, Registrar in Public Health. Um, with Devon County Council, but for this work, I'm the um, Public Health Senior Responsible Officer right across um, the Devon ICS area for the Treating Tobacco Dependency Work Stream. Next slide, please. Um, what I want to take you through um, really is a bit to set the context, a bit about Devon, our population, um, actually what the landscape looks like from a provider perspective, and really take you on the journey that um, we've been on as a system um, to forming our project steering group, um, the values and behaviours we've as a collective signed up to and our governance structure. And then I'm going to share you the good and the not so good. So I've been out to the steering group and I've asked them what it feels like to all be working in partnership, but critically actually can then offer some reflections about what we feel is helping us um, and move forward together. So if we go on to the next slide, please. And I think um, so some of you will know Devon. We've got lovely beaches. We've got lovely national parks. Um, we've also got 1.2 million residents um, across a very large geographic area. Um, we've got complex patterns of rural and urban deprivation. Um, so a large population with very diverse needs and like many other areas in the countries with difficulties accessing services critically across this very large area. Um, just for you, your awareness, we've actually got three local authorities. So um, Torbay and Plymouth are smaller, Devon County Council um, much larger. Torbay and Plymouth have got a much higher sort of urban concentration and Devon a more mixed picture. Um, and if we look at the data at a high level in relation to um, tobacco, you can see that we have areas based on local authority footprints, which are demonstrating worse um, outcomes currently in relation to smoking prevalence, um, smoking in pregnancy and smoking in um, mental illness um, compared with England. Probably not unusual. Just worth pointing out, though, that given the size of Devon, um, we do also have real pockets of inequalities and pockets of poor outcomes that can be masked when we look at data at the full um, Devon population. So if you can move on, please. Um, the next thing to say, so you've actually got a really complex provider landscape. So for this work, we have four local implementation groups. Um, we've got six trusts with footprints that do not match nicely across our three local authorities. We therefore have three public health commission lifestyle service providers. Um, currently, all of our trusts refer into those lifestyle services 
Um, in addition, Plymouth refers into the lifestyle service delivered um, by um, Cornwall um, because of the border. Um, the Royal Devon and Exeter is the only trust currently which has an in-house stop smoking advisor. And then within all of that, we've got a whole range and, and, and different degrees of integration going on between acute trusts, mental health trusts and lifestyle service providers. So it's quite messy <laughs> to start with. Um, and I think that is important um, to think about when we um, when we come to where we are today. So if we um, we move on, please. And I think it is fair to say it's a complex picture. Um, and since June 2021, um, we have been working together up until our steering group was formed in September. So um, the at an ICS level, we um, worked with our Devon existing um, Smoke Free Alliance, um, which has representation from acute trusts, local authorities and wider stakeholders across Devon um, to complete the um, clear self assessments in relation to the different trusts. Um, at an ICS level, we then um, um, built up some potential options for how we might distribute um, the funds coming to us through the treating tobacco dependence um, work stream back to the Alliance. Um, off the back of that, we took on board the feedback and we developed a draft investment plan that went back to the Alliance um, and then it also went to our ICS Health Inequalities Executive Group. And I think it's fair to say, and I can see James on the call, our project manager, we had some extremely animated feedback. Um, and at Jane smiling, but actually from my perspective, I was just so delighted that the system was engaging um, and, and, and we welcomed it. Um, and very, very quickly off the back of that, we pulled together our project steering group um, in 2020, September 2021, which actually covers all three pathways. And you can see from the membership there that it is broad um, in terms of having all three local authority public health teams are there, our three lifestyle providers, our five trusts, with trusts asked to have strategic clinical and operational leads, um, you know, and obviously not all attending at the same time. We've got representation from our, um, our regional and national colleagues, our health inequalities and prevention programme manager, and critically wider partners. So um, the academic health science network representation, as well as the local maternity neonatal system, recognising there's a lot of work going on in that space. So if we keep going, um, next slide, please, we can see the values and behaviours. Um, and the sorts of things that we've got is really focusing on um, our communities. That's really what brings us together. We're large and we're diverse. We have to do on that. Um, we've really st strived to have this sort of culture of listening and supportive challenge and holding ourselves as a steering group to account. Um, we want to be agile, can do, um, and we recognise we need to be driven by the evidence based. But where it isn't there, we really want to um, go for monitoring and evaluation. And there's something for us, I think, about our members as committing to turn up and be present, see that we're ambassadors in our own rights for different populations, but that collectively we also need to work together as an ICS level to target action and investment of areas of greatest need. Um, and then, like a lot of things, we really need to be willing to share and learn within Devon and also the wider evidence base. Um, this is our governance structure, so you can see our four implementation groups going all the way up to the ICS executive leadership. And if we go on um, to the next slide, um, and these are some things people have said. Um, you can see it's not all positive. It's messy, it's complex, it's challenging. The budgets are real, um, but it's hard work and it's absolutely valuable and the right thing for us to be doing. If we go on to the next slide. I popped here some of the things that I feel has brought us together. Um, so we already had some existing relationships. We've allowed for a system focus, um, but we've allowed for variation as well. Our culture, um, where we've had we've had real tangible benefits. So our academic health science network partners are contributing. Um, and when we've had available tools, so such as the modeling, um, we've used that very opening, openly to inform how funds are distributed. It's also helped us, you know, stop getting into conversations about sort of splitting hairs. There are so many partners about sort of monies. Um, we've tried to be pragmatic and respect our colleagues' time. Um, so very practical things like we no longer have lengthy minutes, you know, just sort of action notes. Also not having to have everyone, um, you know, everyone at every meeting, but having, you know, everyone needs. Um. We've also kept an incredibly tight scope on the steering group. 
But we've also, in terms of the treating tobacco dependence long term plan requirements, we've also recognised that for a lot of people that can be really limiting. Um, so we're setting up a separate um, task and finish group structure via the Alliance, which will allow for idea generation and that more creative thinking and can feed ideas up then through. Um, we've had support from our regional and national colleagues. Um, and I think critically for, for me, it's been real learning and working with everyone to really allow for the challenge and debate and seeing that that in itself is a key part of the journey, not being too sort of focused on getting to the end point. And so then if we go on to the last slide, I think this is where we are. Um, our local steering groups are being formed. We've got a maternity pathway audit underway. We're developing an evaluation framework. But I think critically, there are still a lot of things we need to work through. Um, you know, our biggest risk at the minute is a system risk. We've got about one million pound shortfall per annum to um, ensure that um, patients can have access to services um, you know, once they leave, once they leave the acute trusts, how else we as a system going to mitigate that shortfall? Um, other questions, who is our ICS clinical lead? How do we respect the time of our clinicians don't necessarily have that? So what is that role? And one thing we're working through is how do we bring the patient voice into our steering group? That's, That's uh, really, it's, it's, oh, is there Helen, Helen is mine. Hello? Yeah, great. Yeah. I'm getting a bit of feedback. I wonder if somebody okay, else... Okay, let me turn mine off. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. So, I anyway, know. Thanks, everyone. That was really amazing. That was really helpful. The, the issue that you sort of raised about each ICS has got several local authorities, multiple different trusts, rural and um, urban populations. And this is exactly what... I think everybody is is sort of dealing with unless you're very lucky and you're a really small ICS. Um, so these are these are real issues, but it sounds like you've done a, a cracking job. I know one or two people who work in Torbay who might. Um, so you can contact me afterwards and we can see if we can um, interest them in becoming your, your clinical lead, perhaps. But anyway, OK, so uh, our last speaker is uh, Charlotte Jacks, who's the Partnership Commissioning Manager at Wakefield Council. So welcome, Charlotte. Good morning, everybody, and um, thank you for that introduction. I've had two introductions this morning, so that's great. Um, I'm Partnership Commissioner Manager at Wakefield Council Public Health, um, and I'm here today to tell you about what we're doing in Wakefield around partnership working and how we feel that has helped to reduce smoking and pregnancy rates um, across Wakefield. Um, I've put my other colleagues' names on that slide as well because we couldn't literally do it without these guys. So Lisa, Shelley and Tracy are on there as well, just so that you recognise their names in the future. Um, if you can just, um, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about Wakefield. Um, so in Wakefield, every year we have about 4,000 births to Wakefield mums. And in 2021, 14.6% um, of Wakefield pregnant mums were smoking at the time of delivery, compared to 9.5% nationally. Um, although there's been good progress in reducing um, smoking rates in pregnancy, thanks to local and national initiatives, um, Wakefield still remains um, an outlier when compared to our neighbours and the national average. But um, we are heading in the right direction and we are falling at a much faster rate than the national figure. Um, Smoking and pregnancy rates um, are the highest in our most deprived areas in Wakefield and young mums um, under the age of 20 have the highest smoking and pregnancy rates. And as we know, um, stopping smoking in pregnancy is the single biggest change that can improve the health of a mum and baby. And we all know um, about the risks that are associated with smoking in pregnancy. Um, so stopping smoking is the single most effective thing that we can do to reduce um, those risks. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to address the rates of maternal smoking um, in Wakefield? So I'll go back a little bit. So to 2016, um, when NHS England granted us um, some funding, um, they funded um, some areas with the highest rates um, of smoking at time of delivery and Wakefield were one of those areas. We received um, £75,000 within Wakefield. And with that funding, um, we implemented some carbon monoxide monitors and consumables. We also introduced um, a stop smoking specialist midwife um, who is based within our trust. 
We also improve data recording and quality to ensure women can be identified and information is shared appropriately. And we also funded our Incentivised Stop Smoking Programme Personal Financial Incentive Scheme, which had um, been in place for a number of years, but we utilised that funding. Um, both the specialist midwife role and the PFI scheme um, were evaluated and they were so successful that we were able to identify further funding um, by Public Health and Wakefield CCG and they are currently non-recurrently funded um, up to the present day today. Um, next slide please. So um, what have we done in Wakefield to help reduce smoking and pregnancy rates? Well, um, within Wakefield, we have a great partnership working approach in relation to smoking and pregnancy. Um, from a strategic point of view, uh, we have a smoking and pregnancy group uh, in Wakefield with partners from our hospital trust, so that's Mid Yorkshire Health Trust, our Stop Smoking Service, so that's South West Yorkshire Partnership Foundation Trust, our Wakefield CCG, uh, Kirklees Public Health, Wakefield Public Health and other appropriate engagement from across the council teams. Um, we've also secured greater governance for tobacco control in Wakefield. So the work that we do under tobacco control, such as um, smoking in pregnancy, sits under the Wakefield Integrated Care Partnership, uh, which then feeds into the Health and Wellbeing Board. We've also got other meetings that take place across Wakefield as well, um, such as the Tobacco Alliance, uh, which is chaired by our um, councillor. And also we've got the Mid Yorkshire Health Trust Environment Meeting, which is um, a long established group supporting um, the trust towards their smoke free goals. So I'll just give you a little bit of background to our Stop Smoking uh, Pregnancy Midwife that I mentioned earlier. Um, so she's currently funded by Wakefield CCG up to the end of March next year. And she acts as an educator, an innovator, a role model, a leader, and she's an absolute integral part to the Mid Yorkshire Health Trust Maternity Services staff and the wider trust. Her role has been absolutely key um, to providing the relationship with frontline clinicians and the management within the local provider trust. She's unlocked many of the barriers um, to transformational change in pathways and processes. She acts as an agent for change and she educates all staff associated in relation to um, with the risks uh, with smoking in pregnancy. The smoking in pregnancy uh, midwife also provides that peer peer uh, peer to peer discussion um, that despite the excellent relationships between our trust and the stop smoking service had not currently previously been possible. And um, this has resulted in a number of significant changes in practice. As a result of this role and the partnership working that we've got in place, data quality has improved. We've now got mandatory um, training in place in relation to very brief advice um, <clears throat> with our midwives. We also ensure that staff um, are recording their smoking at the time of booking, the status at the time of booking, and the smoking status at the time of delivery. Um, as a result of working in partnership as well, we've also implemented an opt-out scheme. So that's uh, in relation to referrals um, to the Stop Smoking Service. And we truly believe that this has um, created a significant increase to our Stop Smoking Service, but also created a significant decrease in our smoking rates um, at time of delivery. We've also, um, as part of partnership working, introduced extra scans in the trust. So that's for your high risk patients. We now do scans at 32 weeks, 36 weeks and 40 weeks. And our specialist midwife continues to monitor and ensure that midwives are recording the CO reading at 36 weeks as well. Just to give you a little bit more of an example of what our specialist midwife does as well. So in 2019, she saw 180 women and 31 of those women stopped at time of delivery. So that's 17.3%. And bearing in mind that these women have tried to stop smoking before and have not been successful. Um, our specialist midwife doesn't actually deliver the smoking cessation support within the trust. What she does is she uses motivational interviewing to then refer women onto our um, specialist stop smoking service that's within the community. Um, so just moving on to the next, uh, not the next slide, the next bullet point around PFI. So we have a personal financial incentive scheme within Wakefield as well. So any women that are referred into our stop smoking service, say from our midwives or from our specialist midwife, those women can sign up to um, the personal financial incentive scheme, which is a shopping voucher scheme to help women quit smoking two months postpartum. Um, so as I've got here, um, we have a specialist stop smoking service within uh, Wakefield and they work really closely with all our um, smoking and pregnancy colleagues across Wakefield. Um, for example, they've put a process in place um, 
with the specialist midwives. So any women um, that have been referred to the stop smoking service, but then non-engage um, are unable to contact then um, the stop smoking service goes back to our specialist midwife to say these women haven't engaged, they're unable to contact, then our midwife contacts those patients directly via the phone or via our app. We've also got um, a nationally recognised pregnancy pathway toolkit as well uh, in Wakefield, um, which we've put in place with our public health intelligence analyst. And that monitors the woman right from the smoking at time of booking. And we can also see the women who have stopped smoking, um, who were referred, um, and the number of women who have opted out, for example. Um, other partnership examples are our LMS recommendations, so that's your local maternity system recommendations. So the LMS undertook some work last year to identify key standards for prevention, and one of those strands was around smoking in pregnancy. Um, so they were published last July. Um, these recommendations have now been rag rated within um, Wakefield, and we've worked in partnership to um, ensure that we are green um, on those recommendations. Um, Wakefield are now seven uh, out of 28 recommendations were green on 17 so there's still um, around 11 that are amber um, and one that's red so we just need to work together um, to make sure that we're meeting those recommendations. Um, another um, example of partnership working um, in Whitford is our declaration on tobacco control so as well as our NHS tobacco control um, declaration and our local authority declaration um, we actually have a health and well-being board joint declaration as well and i've put the link on that um on that uh, slide there as well if anybody wants to see the news article on that as well and just a final bullet point there around the long-term plan so ongoing discussions are taking place within wakefield and regionally and with our um, local partners around identifying areas of sip work that can be funded through the long-term plan um, there may be some challenges around that, but we hope that the model, the partnership model that we've got in place uh, will be a good foundation for meeting those recommendations. So as you can see, uh, we've still got a long way to go to meet the 6% target around smoking in pregnancy, but if we continue to work together as we are, um, we'll ensure that we're working together um, and heading in the right direction to meet that 6% national target. Thank you. So um, thanks, thanks ever so much. Eating myself again. Thanks ever so much for that. Really helpful. I really like your the the stop smoking midwife and exactly that's sort of exactly what the NHS long term plan really wants. It's that sort of um, uh, intervention. And what's different about maternity services compared to acute and mental health is that most local authorities already have a maternity stop smoking service of some description and the NHS long term plan is about augmenting that and how different areas do it is is what's interesting so Hazel over to you sorry thanks Sanjay um if you want to mute yourself for the moment and I'll invite all of the speakers to join us as well as um Joanna as well if you all want to those of you who are going to turn your cameras on turn your cameras on um, thank you. We've got about 10 minutes for discussion and you've been posting various questions in the chat. There are, there are two, you set a horse running on, on quality assurance, Sanjay. So there's clearly appetite for something around, around that. So we'll, we'll definitely discuss doing something. And also some interesting conversations in the chat around training. And that is something that we have discussed doing a specific event on. Um, it will probably at this stage be in the new year, I think. Um, but we'll see if we can fit it in before Christmas. Um, so over to the questions. I, I mean, just a really, fa really inspiring to hear you all talking and, you know, seeing how people are pragmatically uh, making this work on the ground. Um, a, a question that I'm, I'm going to come to you first, Heidi, on, but I'd be really interested in other people's reflections. There's a, a, many of the examples that people were giving. I'm going to come to some of the questions that people have also asked as well, but this is mine. Um, people were highlighting the role that champions were playing and the individuals within the system have played in sort of facilitating collaboration. And Heidi, particularly, you know, in your role, you, you know, you're very much a kind of linchpin as well of, of how this is all working. You know, to what extent is it possible to put things in place or how are you putting things in place that are kind of structural, which means that, say, you or any of the other champions that are really key to your systems locally get kind of hit by a bus? You know, how does that collaboration get maintained and how can we make that more systemized? Um, question, I'm going to ask you first, Heidi, and then see if anybody else wants to come in. 
Um, I think you're right, Hazel. I think I am that link in this big chain where I am keeping all those key stakeholders across the ICS moving with this piece. Um, I think what's been really good is that with our big, the, the main ICS steering group, there is really good representation and, and it's me that chairs that steering group. But if um, if and my job's only funded for a year, so come March, I may go anyway. If funding, you know, if we can't find more funding to keep me going, then they may, may lose their programme manager. But I think what's good is that we are giving autonomy to the trust. The representation is very senior from the trust that sit on that board that are then taking it back within their organisations, having their own working groups to keep things moving within each trust within Dorset. I don't know whether that's answered your question or not, but I think we are giving ownership to the trusts, working alongside um, other partners to really keep things moving within their own organisation. Yeah, no, I, I, that's a really interesting answer, Heidi. And I think that important bit about getting these organisations, all of the organisations involved in the collaboration to take more ownership. I don't know if others have reflections that they would bring in about the kind of the, the structures versus the, the people. Um, Helena. Hi, um, thanks very much. And I think the question of, I guess, sustainability is really, really key. One thing that came up when we were developing our terms of reference for our group is how long are we as an ICS project steering group going to exist? And um, how, you know, if if the world's going to move to the, you know, is the programme monitoring going to happen through the local care partnerships as they establish, um, you know, and how do things move into a kind of business as usual forum um, with where all the key you know stakeholders are already engaged um i think practically in devon we have a very strong sort of program support structure coming through the ics stroke ccg so um you know in terms of the kind of i guess the tools and templates that can kind of be held um but i think inevitably like anything um if you have individuals who are passionate um you know that's that's how things um get um you know, sort of kick off, but we do need to be thinking about the longer term um, and how, how things can move forward. I think that's right, Helena, and like cultivating and identifying those champions is also really important. So if any of you have tips for those out there who are currently trying to do that, um, uh, put your hand up. Um, Gemma. Yeah, just a second. What Helena just said, for us, undoubtedly the people that were involved in the beginning have made this a success so like for us joe got things done in the hospital that we wouldn't have dreamed of but hopefully we're putting processes in place that would then continue to work without our involvement so hopefully longer term that that that'll work without us but in the beginning i just don't think there's any doubt that we could have achieved what we have achieved without individual people being involved so i think it's kind of inevitable Joe, Joe, if you want to come in and then Sanjay. Yeah, I think you have to have people who've got the vision, who can see what the where the future looks, what it looks like. But also one of my mantras, which I sort of say all of the time is, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So often I will put things in place and tell them, this is what's happened. And then they'll go, oh, we didn't want that. Oh, well, that's what's happened now. So sometimes you have to be sort of a maverick, I guess. More, more tobacco control mavericks, absolutely. Sanjay, you have to unmute yourself. Um, it was just about the clinical champions, and I, I completely get this because, you know, the NHS and how to influence within hospitals can be quite difficult. So um, we've also, um, uh, the, the British Thoracic Society, who house respiratory specialists and respiratory consultants, the idea is that they're now um, starting a programme that will identify and support respiratory clinical champions in hospitals. So those of you who are working in local government, um, you might want to get in touch. There's, a, there's a, um, a woman called Melanie Perry who works at the British Thoracic Society. And she may, I'm hoping she now has a, a little bit of a map of relevant you know, respiratory consultants in hospitals who might be able to help support your programme. So for, for example, I think you, you were talking about that in um, in uh, Dorset or uh, was it Dorset? Devon, sorry, Devon. Um, and she might have an idea of who might be interested. 
Thanks, Andrea. I'm not sure. Melanie may be on, so she might post in the chat. Um, I just have a question actually for Sanjay and Joanna before we I come to the to the rest of the panel. Um, it's been really interesting to hear the sort of diversity of approaches, and I think it, it's definitely worth celebrating the you know the the fact that people are tailoring how um, collaboration and the long term plan works in their locality. But there's also an important thing about the consistency of outcomes. I just wondered if Sanjay and, and Joanne, Joanna, if you might reflect on how regionally and nationally you're you know, supporting and driving that consistency of outcomes, even though we have a, of a, a, you know, a diversity of approaches um, there. I don't know which of you, Sanjay is unmuted, so we'll go with Sanjay. OK, so, so in terms of part of the assurance process from NHS England to regions, to the ICSs, is are you following the NHS long term plan model, which specifies what you know what that looks like? So every patient is screened for smoking in hospital, or every pregnant smoker that they're all seen by um, a tobacco dependency advisor. Uh, a treatment plan is made before they they leave, um, and that that's followed up upon. So you know there's a there's a you know a clear treatment model, and so it doesn't matter how you implement it locally because as we've said, there are different solutions for different areas, especially with a discharge from hospital. Um, it, it, so it doesn't matter how you do it, as long as the patient themselves gets that new intervention. What we don't want is business as usual. And so we've seen with places who don't have tobacco dependency advisors in place. I think it was Heidi, you presented that. Actually, the referrals don't go up because the same problem exists. There isn't somebody dedicated to do that job. And that's where the extra funding comes in and that's how it should be used. And that's what is in the assurance process. And just just to add to what Sanjay's there, absolutely, you know, we need to acknowledge that I think um, as Helena said, there are complexities in terms of the landscape that every area will be working within um, so there is no one size that fits all so to speak but ultimately it's about kind of working together with the patient at the heart um, of everything and kind of developing the services and you know looking to tackle the barriers that are specific to those particular areas um, in order to move forward so that there is the tobacco treatment service as kind of laid out within the long term plan um, for the patients so that they can receive access to the medication so the information can be shared across the um, across the different organizations that are involved there's opportunities for efficiencies at scale and I think you know within the the, the comments in the chats we've already had discussions in relation to training and branding um, you know and these are all different um, solutions that will work slightly differently in each area but do the same thing thanks joanna that's really helpful um we haven't got so much time there, there's a question raised in the chat um which i might reframe slightly so somebody was asking about incentive schemes for uh or provision of e-cigarettes and um and whether people have implemented these and whether they face challenges and how they overcame them i'd be, I'd be you know take Feel free to take that as an example because those obviously are issues that can be contentious. But I wondered if any, if, if you would reflect on on those sorts of issues that you've had to build consensus on across different organisations and how that's been done successfully. If if um if there was any of you that were wanted to kind of grapple with that issue, either or perhaps on e-cigarettes specifically or incentive schemes in pregnancy or any of those other tricky issues that are sometimes out there. One of you wants to put your hand up or I might pick one of you. Go on then, Joanne, Jo. So one of the things that we did was we managed to get signed up for the um, vape trial so that we could get some of our patients and some of our staff as well um, onto the vape trial. So that was one in and then we started to look at what people were doing across the region so we realized that Hartlepool were buying in um, e-cigarettes and vapes for staff so Gemma and, I, Gemma and I are busy looking at how we can implement that within our organization as well and yes we'll go we'll have some kickback but people like Joanna really help with because they give us lots of information to be able to go back to the clinicians to say yes we don't know the full out comes of vaping at the minute but actually it's still better than smoking so we're, it's about building up that support 
in your own areas as well but it's trying to be creative and that's one of the things I think that Gemma and I are very good at is we will look at any opportunity and just see how it might work and then try to find people to help us. Thanks Jo. Helen if you've got a quick additional example that would be great and then we'll I'll um, close. Just I think this is a classic example of us in Devon where we are so large we've got so many different providers and the reality is that activity differs. So I think the question we've asked ourselves as a steering group is how do we feel about that variation? And from our perspective, um, we need assurance and we really welcome it that it's innovative. There's neither an evidence base. If there isn't, what are the measures in place? So the way that we um, and we want to be able to learn and support that sharing, the way we're doing it practically is we've got maternity audits going on at the minute against the long term plan requirements. And within that, our local trusts are being asked to highlight um, any additional activity that's going on so that we can get that visibility um, and and start sharing. Thanks, Helena, and thank you to everybody. I mean, this has been a really interesting session. I mean, the, the point was to, to give people some really practical examples of how you know we can come together locally to, to make this uh, a long-term plan a reality. And I think all of the examples we've heard today have been really inspiring. Loads of great messages in the chat, lots of people com being complimentary about the, the content of the webinar. Um, you know, this uh, will be available. Thanks, John. Uh, this um event uh we'll, we've been recording it we will be sharing it um as soon as we can after this meeting so you can watch it back and share it with colleagues uh the the there was a comment as well about where the resources various resources will be all of the ash webinars are in the in the same place um there they aren't currently on the nhs features platform perhaps that's something we will explore um but we're we'll we'll be circulating information linked to this webinar and all the slides as well um, thank you so much to all the speakers again and to Sanjay for chairing um, the first part and we look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar which is next week or soon um, on uh, um, pharmacotherapy. Thanks everybody. <laughs>